This episode of Capes and Lunatic Sidekicks is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off free shipping and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is Luke of Parrot, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatic Sidekicks podcast. Uh, hello everyone, it's that time again, that's right, it's been one full month, we are back for another discussion with uh, legendary writer Mr. D.G. Chichester. Hello guys, it is uh, maybe becoming the favorite part of my month, you know, <laughs> getting back with you guys, I have to go and I have to like reread stuff and be prepared, it's fun. I know, it's I think it's our favorite time. One of our favorite times because just I know last night Lope was like, tomorrow's Dan, right? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll see that. Otherwise, it's like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Otherwise, she's like, okay, see ya. <laughs> I can I can freshen up the relationship a little bit. I was gonna know? say, make her happy to see me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. So yes. Can I just start this episode though by saying um, I really appreciated the script plot, like, and how you. Um, differentiate the styles between Marvel style and DC style. I oh, think that's very important that you started your plot script off that way. Um, well, when I like forward. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the the, um, the story behind that, if you want one, um, was uh, it was actually, and I'm pretty sure, the last, the last official comic convention I went to as a guest. Um, I, I brought that script and a Judge Dredd s- s- uh, script. And I was, you know, giving them away, or maybe I was, you know, selling them for a small amount, uh, you know, with an autograph. And so those were positioned and put together uh, for that very, that very reason. So the uh, the Marvel one, the Daredevil 380 one you were talking about, I was trying to explain for people who didn't know what it was. And then I had the Judge Dredd script right next to it, which was written in a more movie style script as DC's script style was you know at that time i think a lot of people just write that style now all together and um and so that was and those are the only two uh examples i have left of anything i ever wrote (laughs) because i had this hard drive crash back in 2001 and it took away all of my original comic writing and i just so happened that one of the guys i had i had given those scripts to at that comic convention i became friends with and then years later, he said, "You know, I've got, I've got those two physically here," and he was able to scan those for me and, and give them back to me. So they're kind of like my own little treasure trove of who I was. That's so sad about the great cr- as as the people that read the newsletter know the great hard drive crash of two thousand and one. It was, it was, you know, it was a horrible, horrible moment, and just and I obviously I have all the comics, and that's terrific, and that's ultimately what they were written for. But um, as you can sort of see from reading this plot and then looking at the comic itself there are differences sometimes and it's kind of sometimes interesting to to see that little snippet i was actually reading um i'm doing a an, a podcast tomorrow where the the guy who runs that one wants to talk about the electro mini series root of evil which we can talk about sometime but i was rereading that for him and i i recognized there was a little intro piece I had done for that comic where there was a little snippet of my plot in there, <laughs> like maybe two or three uh, paragraphs. And so that was another little time capsule I wasn't expecting to find. It's like, damn, that's what I wrote like. So ah, They always warned us about Y2K. They never warned us about Y2K1. Uh, it, yeah, it was no. It was, it was one of those stupid things probably of just uh, – you know, oh, let's update to some new operating system and let's not have a backup ready and whatever. Lesson learned won't happen again. But yeah, I guess the issue in question is Daredevil 380. And again, yes. we've been t- telling you people go sign up for Dan's uh, newsletter and you would you can get yourself a uh, copy of the script for this issue. So you could follow along. You can. And we'll, I'm sure and we'll I have talk the about comic it. book, um, the, the digital version open side by side with the script and just like back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Did one make more sense than the other? Ultimately, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. 
interesting to see how things come about, put it to you that way. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, you could see definitely where places were meant to be things, and you could see where Lee was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And <laughs> so, you, so you're talking about different forms of scripts. So, like, when you write a comic, that so is – do you not always do the Marvel method? You do you do different versions? So it's like, and how do you decide which version you're going to do at the time? Um, I, you know, they were called Marvel and DC version, you yeah. know, back in the day, you know, probably Marvel again, being a plot where you would describe a page altogether. Or maybe you would describe a series of pages, right? You, you know, for people who haven't seen this, you might, you might say page one to five, and then you would describe, the incidents that were happening. And that could be really brief in some people's minds. Some people would literally write page one to five, uh, cap and punish your fight. And then it was up to the, the artist to figure everything out. You can see from the way that I wrote, I would describe kind of visual beats, right? You know, little, I, I was almost breaking it down in my head of what the panels might be. And then the DC style, which was the script style, was a lot more like a movie script where mm -hmm. you would describe those visual beats, and then you would write the dialogue already, and it would almost be complete. You might not see that again until the, the comic was published. So while well, they were called Marvel and DC style, because that was sort of the house style, you could still write a full script comic at, um, at Marvel if you wanted to. Nobody was necessarily going to say, don't do that. And probably a DC might have been a little harder. Um, you know, if you wanted to say, I want to do it as a plot, they might frown on that a little bit more then. Um, nowadays, I think more people probably write full script always is what I, is what I, I take it. But I always made the decision based on the artist because I had pretty good relationships with the artists that I worked with and I would try to be in touch with them. And I would say, what is your preference? You know, what is, what is the style that's going to work and open it up for you the most? So uh, with Lee, in this case, uh, you know, coming back and working with him again after many years, we had worked plot style when we worked on Daredevil before, and, and that was a discussion we had, and he was still comfortable with that, so it made sense. And it, uh, I, in a lot of ways, while well, you feel like you have more control over, over a script style, um, I always liked plot style because I would be surprised by things that people would come back with. You know, there's a lot of detail, I think, in this plot. Um, but sometimes an artist would make a decision that you wouldn't expect. And then when you get to the script, it would inspire a different line of dialogue, even though I drop lines of dialogue in here as well. Um, but it was always, what's going to work best for the artist? It's I mean, interesting. Be oh, sorry to cut you off, though, because I, 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 I know a lot of people that, like, try to go from comic books uh, back, like, back in the early 2000s to get into, like, TV and movies and stuff. Yeah. People from Marvel had a little bit of a difficulty transitioning from that plot style, whereas the people from DC, like, specifically, I can speak of, like, uh, Andrew, uh, Dab, Andrew, uh, Dab and Laughlin over on Supernatural, who mm -hmm. were writing comic books and then went into writing for TV, and it, they said it was a kind of an easier transition. Where so oh, really? From Marvel, with the plot style, it kind of starts to make sense mm -hmm. <laughs> why that would be. I, yeah, I guess it again, it would depend on the writer and the way they were doing it. I, I, I mean, I came out of a film school for whatever that was worth. I mean, I, I was always thinking about visuals in that way and and i think i continue it wouldn't have been too hard to change say this this plot into a into a full script teleplay. probably yeah yeah or a teleplay because again i was thinking in the visual beats that's the way i and whether the artist wanted to use that or not i could then see the story and i could then see um where it was going to break down across the pages or where it was going to open up into a big spread uh and if i didn't do that if i just wrote page you know five to 22 <laughs> they fight and i get to go go home early and and uh and then it's up to the artist that's also kind of lazy isn't it i always thought that was unfair to and as an editor i would sometimes get plots like that you know from a writer and and not many but you know i'd say well is this all you're going to give the and artist that's why we have an editor <laughs> exactly like, sort of like really you can't, you can't you can't put a little more work into this because you would get you would get paid the same thing for this, you know, the way I've written this one, as that person who wrote page five to fifteen, they they fight, and that's all that that would be the entire description, which is insane, 
you know. Um, and Lee and I had artists. They, really, artists are so unsung sometimes. <laughs> oh, you know, and they they need to sing themselves. When you look at what the the beautiful thing about today is, you know, when you watch the live feeds of some artists from their studios. I was watching one actually from Lee the other night. I happened to stumble upon it. He was inking um, some Batman thing, Ooh. and and you realize, yeah, it, it was. It, it, I said, look, look at all that ink. Um, but you realize how much work goes into it. It's it's just crazy. And so they deserve both all the praise and all the profit that they can get out of the work they put into it. Definitely. <clears throat> and again, it's like, you know, if it comes out like the if, as the writer, if it comes out, if you don't give them that detail, if it comes out not looking in the way you wanted it, it's like you have, the, have no one to blame but yourself because it's like, well, you didn't tell them that, you know, what you wanted specifically. Right, exactly. I mean, sometimes it goes the other way where you do put a lot of detail into something and an artist will come back and sort of throw out everything that you've you've tried to put down or takes the plot and the story in a different direction or even quote unquote ruin something because they they chose not to, to do it. And then you're, you, you know, you're having to figure it out or try to get the editor to say, you need to get so-and-so to go back and and redo this because it doesn't make sense for the story anymore. Um, sometimes editors would do that. And sometimes editors would say, nah, we're on schedule, figure it out. And, <laughs> you know, and then it's up to you to kind of run with it. <clears throat> but no, uh, that, that's funny that you know, we're talking about uh, like the TV and movies. Like th this script did remind me, I'm like, oh, I could easily see this being adapted as like a TV show or a movie of some kind, just, the flow is insane of the script, though. Seriously, oh, yeah. sometimes when I'm reading like just regular, even just random already produced stuff, I'm just like, I can see where they made the changes and why. <laughs> but this has had it had a really good flow. But do you have a story behind the actual title? Why you chose the title for this issue? The just one good story. Yeah. Yeah. It actually no. It's it's um, it well. There's two reasons. Um. <laughs> like one, it's just a really good story. <laughs> there's, there's two reasons. Um, one is um. Uh, it was it was right around the time of Archie Goodwin's death, and Archie Goodwin was my mentor, which and I worked for him, which is dedicated to him. Know. And uh, Archie Goodwin was, for people who don't know, was an amazing editor and writer. Uh, he was the person I worked for when I worked at Epic Comics, and uh, and was a huge influence on me and many other people. And uh, and he was just an amazing storyteller. So. Around the time of his death, we dedicated the the book to him. I asked Lee if that was okay with him, which it was. And as a storyteller, it was you know I wanted to say it's it's just one good story. The other thing was a little bit of of chess beating and maybe hubris um, in the sense that, and we can get into the why me and Lee got on, onto this book if you want to talk about about that in a second. But the daredevils that had come before this were maybe in a different direction <laughs> or were in a different direction. And when the editor called me and then I called Lee and, you know, convinced him to, to, to work on the book with me again, is we didn't want to do whatever Daredevil had been in the preceding issues. You know, this was coming as, as it was going to shift over to, to Kevin Smith and Joe Quesada and their new Daredevil, which was going to be its own thing. But the things that had happened maybe in between the time that I had last worked on Daredevil and, and Lee had last worked on Daredevil, you know, we were sort of saying, well, this is our, our last shot, you know, to work on Daredevil, quote unquote. Um, uh, so let's tell just one good story. You know, let's just go back to the roots of what we did together and, and go back out there and say, this is how we approach the character. This is how we want to do things. So if you have a chance to tell just one good story, um, this is it. And, you know, it, there were so many little bits and pieces and elements that ultimately came together because of it. Uh, that was the little chess beating around it, if you will. <laughs> good thing it worked out, and it was really exactly. Good story. We were sucked with that title, right? If man, if we had like dropped the ball on it, um, uh, but it, it it ends up uh, you know clicking together pretty well. And I mean, yeah, thank goodness because I mean, it is like the the last issue of uh, Volume One, so yeah, yeah. Right, and then everything you know comes after that. And what are they on volume four now? Volume th three, at least. But oh yeah, it's good. I think it's at least volume four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> My 
modern comics. <laughs> I know, I know. Let's renumber. You know, some hey. just sell a numbering kit where you can just go into the store and just. I want this to be the new number one. Hey, it's a worthy bookend because I mean, look who who did number one, Stan Lee. I mean, it's 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 worthy bookend. Oh, I I was you know we were very um, I mean pleased to do the story and and when Tim called, uh, which was completely unexpected, um, it was uh, it was very flattering to think about uh, having a chance to do something like this. Okay, can I guess why they called you? Uh, was Kevin Smith running late? No, no, it was. <laughs> Kevin, I don't. I, I mean, I'm sure he'd begun by that point, or maybe he hadn't. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it was obviously coming up on on his run. Um, Tim Tui, who was the editor um, uh, at that point, um, I, I I knew him from back when I was on staff, or at least had been writing. We we were friendly, and he liked the work that I had done on Daredevil, uh, especially with Lee. Uh, we were both Alien fans, which was another little bonding moment in the movie Alien and Alien. So we'd always have conversations around that. Um, so we knew each other. Uh, but he had been given the, the, the Daredevil title as a kind of a lame duck editor. I think he would, he would say this. And, and uh, you know, we had talked about this. So the run that was up to there were stories he didn't like. You know, they're, they're, uh, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. Um, and, and they weren't jiving with him. And, and as a lame duck editor, his job was just get the issues out until Kevin and Joe take over, right? And the new, the new big, powerful, great daredevil is going to happen. You just need to kind of like, you know, make sure the floors are, are swept with this last stuff. And so he could have done that and was doing that, you know, to an extent, maybe with the, the issues that were running. But he said daredevil deserves better to, to go out, you know, with its first issue than just where it is so since he had that lame duck control which means also that no one's probably really paying attention to what he's doing as an editor um he said let's take it back to a high point which in his mind was the work that lee and i had done so he called me up and and this was at a time where um i was in a kind of a low place i wasn't doing a lot of work i mean things had shifted for me in, in comics and other places so i didn't have a lot of marvel work probably no more work going on if I'm, if I'm honest and so to get that call from tim saying do you want to come back and do one issue of daredevil um well <laughs> you know it's like i don't know let me think about it tim i don't really yes you, you know but you know the the thing that he wanted was me and lee and uh you know for for good reason and uh and and lee wasn't wasn't into it right you know lee had moved on Lee had become, you know, even more of a force of nature than he was. And now he's even more of a force of nature, um, you know, for very good reason. But he was doing his own thing. He was writing. He had worked on many other characters. And so for him, it wasn't an immediate, yes, let me go back and relive my glory days or work with Dan or, or something like that. It was very much, um, uh, you know, having to convince him in the sense that this was going to be a you know lilith one good story that would be worthwhile to add to his you know his portfolio you know uh versus oh yeah we're just doing daredevil again like that's the type of artist he is that he wants to always be adding to the things that he's doing so um i can't remember what it was that i did it wasn't a bribe you know we actually talked about it we talked about what the story could be and the beats that we would have and how it would be different than what we we did before um and obviously there's a couple of nods to it one especially if you didn't pick up on it i'll i'll tell you about but <laughs> but um uh, uh but you know it was it was a it was an active discussion and then you know i'm thankful all the stars aligned and he ultimately said yeah this would be one good story this would be great to work together and this would be something new uh and not something from yesterday. So is that the reason you said you wanted something different than your previous Daredevil run? Were you just like, Lee, it's going to be completely different, you know? Well, yeah, and it's not completely different, right? It, it's okay. in fact, in fact, it feels it's it's a return to form. I mean, I could I could go oh. from I could go from three hundred to this. Oh yeah, and, and and say yeah, this is the same team, this is the same guys, but but there are there are a lot of different things, but there are a lot of the similar qualities of the city as a character, 
you know, when you're going around, there's when you're when you're working with Lee, everything becomes real and hyper real at the same time, right? You feel like you're in that that stripper stripper club. You feel like you're, you know, you're burying that guy out in Bayside or whatever. You feel like you're walking through Chinatown. You feel uh, like you're in that office where that poisons, you know, going through the water and all these things. Um, it, it, there's, the, you know, he makes it, you know, the moment, you know, so real, but the, the, and then bringing back the kingpin, you know, and having the kingpin be a part of the story, but, but differently, you know, there's, there's, there's a little bit of a nod to the past, but the framing of the elements, you know, was something we hadn't done. And we were both more mature than when we did it. We were kids when we did Daredevil. I mean, we were really just like, we were in such a, a ridiculously fortunate place. And both of us were coming into our own, I think, as writers and pro me as a writer, him as an artist, us as professionals. So now we were better at our craft. And that was also the lens of, of, of looking at it. I really enjoyed the interspersed black and white panels. Oh yeah. Like the red and then the black and white. It was just really, truly chef's kiss. And you wrote that in, you integrated that into the script as well. And I'm like, oh, that's neat. Yeah, it was, it was you know, and that, that's, I think, you know, where the discussions, you know, were coming forward, right? Because this wasn't a matter of like, great Lee, you're on it, let me go write the script. You know, there were certainly conversations around how are we gonna handle the courtroom scenes? How are we gonna handle you know, uh, certain things like that. Um, but that's also an instance of, you know, what I was talking about before, when you, when you see the work and then it gives you a different direction to think about, even though I knew how those scenes were going to play out in a way, I remember thinking there was one line, um, and I can go look it up, but, um, but where I was describing Matt Murdoch's voice in, in the courtroom. And it's something, you know, and I hadn't really ever described that before or done something like that. And it, it was only in looking at the art that I kind of came to that moment thinking his voice isn't actually modulated and a courtroom voice. His voice is, is like, I'm, I'm going to fuck you up <laughs> all, all the time. Like I'm daring you, you know, in, in that sense of, of the quality of his voice because you know the line i think between murdoch and daredevil is like so razor thin pa yes paper as opposed paper. to like you know <laughs> that's his like one of his many great flaws okay. is and so i think that was only in thinking about that from the plot outwards and then seeing the artwork and then writing it at that moment to say that's how, how i'm going to talk about his voice yeah, because I think I mean I think they even showed that real quick in the movie. But yeah, he's always he can hear those heartbeats and he can be like, okay, this person doesn't like me. I'm gonna have to pour on the charm or you know. Right, right. Although in the TV show, I think we you know we watching it here, we always conclude it like, yeah, Matt's really a good lawyer if he shows up. But ultimately, if you're in trouble, you Thank probably you. you probably want Foggy on your side. Or 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 Saul Goodman before you want Matt Murdock. Really. We always say get somebody get She Hulk on the phone. <laughs> exactly, or She Hulk. Anybody except Murdock. You know, it's like you know. It's, you think that's like he, his? He'd rather be out beating up people yeah. than be in the courtroom. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you think that's like his greatest weakness that it comes so easy to him that he's just like, oh yeah, I'll just stroll in there five minutes beforehand and win the case. Yeah, he's of course he's that's that's the that's the essence of the character, right? That's what I think about, again about that razor thin line. You know, you've got some characters who are, I'm this when I'm in my quote unquote real identity. I'm this when I'm in my, my superhero identity. But I think, I think that is the strut of Murdoch, right? He is, he is a daredevil. He is a fighter with or without the horns. And, and so he is a, a naturally talented lawyer. You know, he, he has, you know, adeptness at that. He's also trained and, but, there's a there's a cockiness, there's an ego to this that allows him to sort of walk in and say, yeah, I can get I can get this, and many times he will, but there's but you know when he's his life is fracturing, which it often does, you know, then woe be that client who might be waiting for him to be the best advocate for him. <laughs> And again, so and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to kiss your butt or anything. But I mean, come on, people. I mean, look, this is a writer here. I mean, he's thinking about the tone of Matt Murdock's voice in a comic. I mean, come on, kids. 
Yeah, it's, you know, well, but that's about the artist too, though. And oh, they, yeah, they, they, you and Lee have great synergy. It's obvious. So it's like he thinks of the little things because that can help in the artist, you know, mind's eye mm -hmm. of how he's going to draw that. Absolutely, and 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 the the, some... the facial expression, the, right? If he's if he's balling his fist or anything like that, you know? right? And that could be the moment that you focus on the balling of the fist instead of the rest of it. You know, you put that in the in the plot, and or if you've talked about that. Just as you, you know, you've seen probably in a lot of movies and TV shows, you know, sometimes the camera focuses on the strangest things, but it gives more intent. It's a hint. <laughs> yeah, and it communicates more, and then it's a it's a better better story for that, or it refocuses your eye. Definitely. Um, so where did the, where did the idea for this whole story? I mean, for the the whole, you know, the politics of this story. Because I know some of the other stories we talked about, you said, oh, I read something somewhere. Or, so where did you get the idea for this? Well, the sir, clip file. <laughs> yeah, the clip file. Where do we go back to? I mean, um, so when did this book come out? When was uh, when did this actually get published? It's like 98, because I think, isn't that when Kevin Smith started? Right, right. right. So, let's see. Um, what does the Indicia tell us? Um, I want to say, like, I think you're right, but, um, yep, 98. All right, so, you know, I mean, there was a lot of, I think, you know, there was, there was this, we weren't into 2000, 2001, and, and the, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole madness, you know, everyone descends into, you know, after 9-11 and stuff, but there was certainly tension about, about the Middle East and, and things, um, and so that will, you know, definitely fueled, you know, thinking about the prejudice against, uh, uh, you know, the individual that, that gets accused of, of being the terrorist, you know, with it. So there were aspects of that. Um, there were there were aspects of of um, uh, I think the biggest thing that drove the story was, yes, pieces, Lilith, from the clip file in terms of, oh, I, I know about Chinese, you know, New Year or I know about lucky money or, you know, the way that, you know, say, you know, gangs will intimidate, you know, store owners and, and, and that bit. In it. So I had all those things packed away. But coming back into it um, after such a long point and having had so many different reactions to the Daredevil work I had done and looking at all the things that maybe had been done since I had done it, um, I, it was really about points of view, right? It was really about what were points of view about who Daredevil was, about who Daredevil could be, when Daredevil was like on top, when Daredevil was being treated as a clown, now Daredevil is going to have a new identity with with uh, with Joe and and Kevin. Although that was really never you know part of my thinking, but all the different points of view about who Daredevil was and what I had contributed to it, and to some degree, and what and the reactions to that really fueled that multi point of view story. And one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite movies is a Kurosawa film called Rashomon. Do you guys know this film? Mm -mm. So um, so Rashomon, I'm going to do it a disservice here, is in like feudal Japan. And there's an incident that happens in the forest between, I think, a samurai and a, and a vagabond and a woman and maybe one or two you know, other characters. And then the, the film basically returns that incident again and again and you see it from the perspective of each of those people. And, and so by seeing it from all these different perspectives, at some and you as the viewer get some sense of, all right, well, the, what's the real story here? But you never really know, right? You know, you never really know because it's being told from all these different perspectives. So in some ways, this was also a little bit of a nod to that, or at least an inspiration from that, is if you had this one big incident that happened, and you know we fill in the gaps around some things, but all of those moments, especially toward the end, where they see five or six different daredevils, <laughs> you know everything from the from the the Aryan Man Daredevil, Death Devil, which was which was you know me giving a little bit of a snark to people reacting to the Fall from Grace Daredevil is like, well he's got armor now. No, it's not armor, but you know people going on about well, you're giving him armor. You know he's not a daredevil anymore if he has armor to the jokey daredevil which was a little bit of a of a nod to some of the things tim i don't think was crazy about in some other daredevil stories where daredevil had become goofy and gaggy and didn't really seem to, you know, to play to his character to um 
to just, you know, how could other, how would other uh, um, groups and gangs and whatever throughout New York act as if they were the voice of Daredevil? Like, you know, Daredevil, of course, is going to be a mob thug or Daredevil is going to, you know, talk more street or Daredevil is going to act in certain ways. N none of those and yet all of those are Daredevil, right, to those people. So it was a tough thing. I mean, I, I you know, for coming back into it and giving a kind of a lame duck assignment, quote unquote, you know, it, it, was, <laughs> it was like, why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> Uh, but but that was part of the appeal of what Tim gave us as an opportunity. We had a chance to really bring that to life in a way and in a story that we hadn't really told before, which uh, going back a little to what you were saying or what we were talking about before, I think that may have been part of the appeal to Lee too. He hadn't done a story like that. We hadn't done a story like that with Daredevil. So how do you do something different and play it out in all those different ways? And it and it's a, like a few. It's a little longer. It's a few extra pages. Was was that their idea, or did they just say, "Oh, you know, tell, give us your story"? It doesn't it just matter. Happened. Be a little longer. Yeah, um, yeah, it is longer, which was good. It, it needed oh, yeah. definitely more more pages to breathe. Um, uh, you know, I I can't remember like in um in all in all detail of of what of how that was. It might have been. In, in once we sort of got Lee on board, you know, saying to uh, to Tim, we've got a chance now to do something a little a little bit uh, special. Can you get us an extra pages or a double size issue or whatever it ends up being? And and I guess he was able to kind of go back and maybe make that justification because it was the last issue mm -hmm. and those things. So once we knew that, then we were able to blow it out and open it up more, which it definitely needed. It would have been a very uh, different and different story probably would not have been the same story if we only had 22 pages to, to tell it at that point. But yeah, I, I love like the little call outs to your runs and stuff. Like, um, like you said, we we're talking about the armor stuff. You know, I was the first time I read that. I'm like, Oh, is that them saying, you know, just see, see, could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much worse that it was just like, that was the reaction. I got, I got from some people who always struck me, apologies to them i guess but as someone uninformed they would look at the 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 costume or the uniform or the outfit you know from a mile away and say oh you gave daredevil armor yeah therefore daredevil is not a a uh, a risk taker anymore because look he's protecting himself yet what do we ultimately see in the tv show we have him go and and go and and get himself mm -hmm. a an outfit that is protective not because he's not taking risks. He certainly is. You got to take smart risks. It's smart risks, exactly. So that was the point of it. So, yeah, that was a nod, uh, you know, to those type of reactions. Or um, Yeah, I think people were just in shock in the 90s. You know, a lot of people changed costumes. A lot. Some of them got armor. But I'm just like, some of those just seem like sales ploys and stuff. I'm like, you actually had story behind like a costume change and stuff. We, we like, tried. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. We had some sales ideas in mind, but we also worked it into the story and we had, and we had good reasons for what we were doing. And I was also thinking about the stories ahead where ultimately we would go back to a more traditional uh, costume, but, but the reasons for doing that would have also come out of, the story, right? It would have been just not like one day saying, oh, we beat this, this costume to shreds and, and oh, I have this old one hanging in the, in the closet, I guess, or, you know, I'll put this on instead. There was going to be a progression of things that would go, as go through. As long as he wasn't feeling the actual color, I think all the fans were okay. <laughs> as I a like, reference. I like, I like how the red feels, you know, and, uh, but the biggest, um, uh, the, the biggest nod to the past, you know, that I worked in was uh, um, the one line that, that Lee hated, 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 hated uh, from uh, Daredevil 300 uh, was uh, was when I wrote, uh, you know, Daredevil has, has vanquished the kingpin and the kingpin's lying in the, the dirt outside of Port Authority. And uh, and I have him go through this whole mental thing in his head. And he ultimately says, I forgive you. Um and Lee hated that line, hated it. Just, we had such an argument over, over writing that line and, and, uh, you know, him trying to, you know, say, he'd never say that he would, 
you, you, you should pull it. It doesn't make sense. And uh, ultimately, it, you know, it kept it in. And uh, but then that was the reversal. Then in, in 380, when he's <laughs> you know he's got the kingpin on the ropes, and he says, "There's no forgiveness this time." And it was just a. <laughs> I don't know. I can see Lee reading the script. They're like, yes! That's good. Well, the, uh, I'll tell you a funny story, or at least I think it's a funny story. Um, so uh, when I, I hadn't seen Lee in person in, in a long time, and uh, and he was going to be at a comic convention uh, here in Connecticut and um, uh, a few years ago, more than a few years ago. And, uh, and so I sent my son over to the table, uh, and so he hadn't seen me. He had never met my son in person. And, and if he had seen any pictures, it was little. So my son was probably around 12 or 13 at the time. And I sent my son over with Daredevil 300. And, and I had him said, Mr. Le Weeks, you know, I, I, I love this book so much. You know, thank you, could, you know, for doing it. Can you autograph it for me? And then as Lee was autographing it, I had him say, but, you know, I really hate it that I forgive you line. What was that all? <laughs> so Lee had no idea that I was at the convention. And, and I'm watching him for a distance and I could see his reaction at that moment. You know, it was like looking up at this kid, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so uh, then, you know, we, we, we revealed the gag, but I thought it was a, a good moment to get his attention. Uh, that would have been funny. Been like, yeah, is that SOP writer? I exactly. Is it pretty much, he was like looking around, wait a minute, he's gotta be here somewhere. But uh, oh, but yeah, because there were so many homages to your run, like the Kingpin. Uh, you had a member of the hand, cause you yep. did, like, with the hand. But you threw in Bullseye. Was this uh, like either you or Lee saying, you know what? We never really got to work with Bullseye. You know, this is our chance to work with Bullseye. Um, you know, certainly it was it was a nice beat. I don't remember that it was it was around. Oh, here's our chance to finally kind of pull this character in. I don't know if that was the rationale or it just felt like we needed uh we needed some badasses to frame out the situation you know we needed some real firepower with bushwhacker and you know bullseye and beats like that um and everyone is a little bit of cannon fodder uh, to some extent you know they're they're definitely going to get trounced by by daredevil by the end of this um but i would say that they all felt like they served a good purpose as either a nod uh, to what we had done and also just framing out well, who should Daredevil feel like when he's dealing with these type of characters? You know, because in that last bit, if there's anything that's a truth to the story, it's certainly that last little section, you know, where he just goes at them so effortlessly, you know, and he, he takes them down and he dodges the bullets and he redirects Bushwhacker's uh, shots to light the fuse. You know, he's so in his game. He's so in his moment. Um, you know, it just felt like this is how he should act it, when he's really in the zone. Uh, so that was a nice way to sort of acknowledge, yeah, he deals with the hand. He deals with crazies like Bushwhacker, even though Bullseye has the precision. Daredevil's got another angle on that, that even Bullseye's precision can't match. And then the ferocity of, of Kingpin, which is always so great to play with, you know, just becomes... Yeah, you're the big man, you're the fat man, you're all these things, but um <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, just just I mean and there was a there was a moment in that too where he just which which flashed back to some of the other things I felt uh, I had done where he just he makes choices that are just kind of crazy and ruthless, like saying, Yeah, you can get out of here, but you're gonna get out of here burned and baked and suffering. So I'm not killing you, I'm not putting you in a in a in a situation like that um but i'm i'm a little bit crazy i've set up a, a really kind of crazy situation which i'm even going to have trouble getting out of this boat right <laughs> you know he's you know he's seconds ahead of the blast when he's actually getting away from it so uh there, there's a little bit of an edge to the character when you when you play with it like that and i mean like we said the, the issue is a little bit longer it's just a few pages but for you is do you find that easier or harder where it's like, you know, in your run, you, you might have had like four issues or more or at least two to like stretch your legs a little bit, you know, let the thing breathe. Is it hard, easier or harder just doing like a one issue story? Um, it, it all it it depends on on 
on how you're planning it going in. So that's why I'm pretty sure we knew going in. We had to, we, of course, we knew going into this that this would be longer. Um, and because um, you wouldn't have written or created a story like this with all these elements and coming back and forth if you didn't have the, the size. Um, one issue stories um, are, you know, can be can be great. They can be they can be fine. They can be easy to do. Uh, one of the ones we may get to at some point is what was it? Daredevil three hundred four, which oh, was yeah. thirty four hours, which was yeah. a one issue story. As one of my favorite pieces, you know, I'll, I'll hold that up against a lot of other things of just a day in the life. Um, you know, story that, that really hit all the beats. So uh, something that's self-contained uh, can be uh, actually, you know, maybe nicer because you're not having to worry about all the other things that you need to kind of thread through. And, and what do I need to pull in from next month? What do I need this? Or I'm sorry, from last month, what do I need to set up for next month? So that can be refreshing just to focus on the story. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, we're definitely gonna have to get to that three hundred four. We're we're definitely gonna get there. I love that. I love that issue. Yeah, because as you're saying, I'm like, yeah, three hundred four was great. It's uh, okay. So yes, this guy's the master. He can do short stories, long stories. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Sometimes you know the what I thought you were gonna ask was like about the extra pages. Sometimes extra pages can work oh. against you. You know that can that can become like ah, I got all the time in the world. I got all the space in the world, and then you get to a um you know, you've written yourself into a corner and then you have a page to get out of it. And then you, <laughs> and then you may end up like, we've all seen those, those stories. It goes, mm -hmm. exactly. It's just, sometimes I've written those stories and you're like, Oh, what did I do? Oh, got to rip that scene out and go back and start and just make it a cliffhanger. We'll worry about it. Next well, then, that, then that's the other thing too. Can I make, can I make this six issues instead of five, you know, cause then I can get myself out of it. And I think there was a couple places where I might've called an editor and, and said, can I extend this by one more, you know, story? Or you see the stories where it like builds up, builds up, and then it like ends in like one punch or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, or it doesn't go anywhere. There was, there was a classic um uh X-Men story, I remember. And uh and and it was like they I found think we met all of them. <laughs> As an X-Men fan, I can say that. Yeah, that I'll take there, there was there was a story back, you know, this was going back to that that time, but I remember like you turned the page and they came upon like the brood, you know, the alien, you know, sort of thing, uh, the alien uh, riff. And there's like, the, there was a crash spaceship or there were eggs or something out in the desert. And it was like, oh my God, the brood is back. And then the, it never got acknowledged again. <laughs> it just, it just, it just dropped off the face of the earth. And I remember that distinctly saying, what happened? Like, where did they, I thought they were setting up that they were going to New creative team. It Maybe matter. that was it. Maybe that was it. I think that's the, all usually what it is. Yeah, someone else takes over and just like drops this. Drops it completely. Out. Yeah, certainly. I've, yeah, I've seen that happen. I mean, the funniest thing I always, it always sticks in the back of my head. And these were back issues I picked up. It's like, I think it was in the 70s, Captain America. Steve Rogers was living in some apartment. And one of the neighbors, like they always showed him in shadow. And it's like, oh, he has some evil plot. He's going to get Steve Rogers or, you know. And right. Then, so they like, bring in a new creative team and he moves apartments. And like that guy's never acknowledged. Never like, seen again. Yeah, he's like, gone. 40 years later, that guy's still sitting in that the apartment. I'm going to get you. Waiting, waiting. Yeah, it's like, I know when he's going to come. He's going to come out any day now. <laughs> He missed, he missed the moving day. It's Falcon's problem now. Exactly. It is Captain America's problem now, you know. <laughs> yeah, did you watch did you watch Falcon Oh, Day? absolutely. I was I was riveted. I just thought they handled that so so well and such a, a different quality to Sam and and the way he you know, he approached things and the the monologues they wrote for him and uh and just even when they switched the title at the end, I blinked for a second and sort of like, wait a minute, are they announcing a new movie or something? No, he is Captain America. And it was just such a such a great, great, you know, beat. And and I remember even thinking back to Endgame. It's like, I mean, I love Sam and he's a great character, but how is he going to be Captain America thinking about the physicality, you know, more than anything? And so the training and then the way that they use the, the suit just to give him just enough little pushback you know the wings clipping into the ground or the the jets or whatever letting him push forward just a little not becoming a new tony stark sort of thing but just a little nudge 
Um, and the ultimate loot box from Wakanda was just a great, you know, thing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, yeah, I dug it. I, I can't what wait to see it. What a great time happens. to be alive for like a lot of the, uh, maybe the, a lot of the comic book writers who didn't necessarily um, get their flowers back in the day. Now they're pulling all the good stories from Marvel TV oh, and movies. I, I had a chance. those back issue hunts and, you know, get on Twitter if you ain't already on Twitter. <laughs> Carl Potts, um, who was, you know, one of my editors and a good friend and, um, and, uh, had given, uh, uh, invited me to go along with him to see Infinity Wars, you know, at the premiere in New York, like they, they had a big Marvel sort of premiere and, uh, um, and, you know, I sat down, I'd seen a lot of people in a long time. So I was seeing some people, I sit down, I'm sitting right behind Tom Palmer who was the inker who worked on many, many things, but he worked on a ton of the Avengers stuff. And I knew Tom from back in the day. And I just remember saying to him, what does it feel like to see these stories? Because he worked on all those stories, right? He worked on these stories that were so much part of, of that storyline. So what's it like to see this stuff, you know, <laughs> come to life in this way? And you never was, dream in a million years. It never, like, never, none, none, none of them did. None of us did, you know, that you'd see this to this level of, of, uh, you know, excitement and execution and it feeling, you know, so real. I mean, they've done a masterful job of, uh, of capturing what always worked in the comics and now making them, you know, feel like, um, you know, that, that you're missing something if you're not, enjoying it when when wandavision you know finally kicked back in and then falcon and the winter soldier uh, i realized how much i missed that little opening music you know because yeah. we'd had a year plus you know we were used to a marvel movie every two month three months right and then we hadn't had anything for a year and suddenly when you hear that little that riff you know it's it's like this psychic trigger that yeah i need that i need that that stuff that's not the boys. Give me my head of dopamine already. <laughs> exactly, right? It's not the boys. It's not Invincible. It's not some meta commentary on superheroes that's actually, you know, excuse me, pissing all over them. You know, I want something that's just enjoying the hell out of them. And that's what, you know, this is kind of bringing, bringing back. Oh, yeah, I hear that music. I'm just I'm like, I'm just oh, waiting I, on a new Daredevil movie. That's it. I that's know. All. Fantastic I'm, Four and Daredevil. That's um, all I want. I'm I'm crossing my fingers. I was talking to Cool Jit Mithra, who runs the, the Man Without Fear um, website and has been like one of the biggest advocates for Daredevil forever. I said, Hey, put in a good word for us, will you? We really love to have him on. I Thank will you. absolutely. I, absolutely. I'll let him know. I mean, he's a great guy. And, but I said, Is Charlie Cox in, in the new, uh, you know, in the new Spider-Man, because that's what I'm holding out. Yeah, for. I want not that. Not that again. Peter Parker wants Matt Murdock as his lawyer, but <laughs> <laughs> but not really. It's not foggy. It'll be okay. <laughs> as long as Foggy shows up at the end of the scene, but I would, I would, I would love it if if that Daredevil is the Daredevil in in the movies. Oh yeah, they well, it has to be Matt Murdock. So they're not ready to reveal Jen Walters yet, so Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah, they better come out with another uh, Daredevil movie or uh, Disney. With actual movie. real Marvel Disney money behind it. Yes, I need it in my life. And I will stand up and cheer and embarrass my wife when uh, in the credits it says special thanks to DG Chichester. <laughs> <Yes! laughs> Thank you. I would too. I would too. I guess, I guess you know, but. Um, I, I enjoy the you hell. You better out of have her better. film it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it's one of those theater things. Like first we'll, reaction. We'll just record, dear. Why? Oh, you'll see. <laughs> but yeah, I three eighty is so good, and it's just like it's just such a wonderful way to end a volume. Like, thank you. Yeah, that's Chef exactly. Says, no, seriously, it felt like coming home, and I wonder because it feels like it felt like coming home for you too. Like you just get that vibe. The synergy between the two of you with the storytelling and the artwork and the back and forth and the multiple points of view and being in his head and it's just like a hello and a goodbye and a right. hug you know i could not have described it better i i think that is thank you for saying that lilith that is that is probably if i could flash back to how i felt doing it um and 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 even just looking at it now um that is definitely you know, the zone I was, I was in, right. As I said, like, Oh my gosh, I haven't worked on a lot of comics. I need some work. It, when Tim called, that was probably the first thing in my mind of like, yes, I've got some work, you know, to, to do. But once it, the, the, the work itself kicked in, 
and then and then being with the character and being with Lee, you know, not not a nostalgia, right? But but all those things you just said, right? This is something I cared about. This is somebody I cared about. That being both the character and Lee, and finding that you know that coming home that you know re-embracing of certain things reactivating a lot of those tools and the my my point of view i don't know if it was i think it was unique at the time i'm sure other writers have played with it more but i think my point of view on the senses was a little bit different than than other people's and and at least the way i sort of applied certain things and so going back into that and bringing those forward and and doing you know the nods to uh uh the city again in a way yeah it was it was all coming home it was a it was definitely that feeling what was the deadline like how many how many weeks did you have to get this done um it wasn't it wasn't uh you know i, I couldn't tell you exactly it wasn't uh it wasn't overnight but it wasn't it wasn't take all the time you want because it was you know <laughs> it was it was somewhere in between you know the zone again of 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 the person who was still finishing the stories, right? That would come before, right? You know, 379 or, or, or whatever. Those may have been done, I don't know, but but definitely Joe Casada and Kevin Smith were were on the horizon, you know? So I would say, you, you know, tip, typically there was probably, look, you know, a, a, a two to three week zone to, to write something like that. That just and then, in my anxiety. <laughs> and then, and then Lee, you know, a, a typical issue, you know, to, to be a professional, right. And which Lee definitely is, um, you have to illustrate a book a month, right? There's no, you at least one book a month. I mean, when I was at the height of writing things, I was probably writing four books a month at, you know, that was probably how many books I was writing at any given time. A writer obviously has less, less to do. Um, but you know, for a professional artist, um, I think you know it's it's basically got to be about a book a month, and then, and then the, and then the inker had to come in. So Al, Al ink this. Did Al ink this? Um, no, Campanella. Campanella ink this. And um, so um, you know, so that's probably two to three weeks, um, and then the colorist probably had you know a week to two weeks, the letterer a week to two weeks. So this is probably about two months, two, two and a half months, I would say, out from publication is probably when we, you know, we, we might have gotten that call to kind of be right in the zone of, of doing it. Um, and then then it was now now it's different, you know, digital thing yeah. that was all completely physical stuff, FedExing pages back and forth or. You know, oh, maybe, not FedEx. I know. <laughs> faxing, you know crazy crazy thing faxing was like oh my god i can fax my plot in you know um but but yeah i would i would say it probably was a two week two to three week most to write this to write that plot that's that's amazing honestly oh, yeah. <laughs> to have that kind of like you know like pressure it's like okay this is the last issue the last volume got to get these creative juices flowing you gotta get it well, going yeah <laughs> and 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 but then that's you know that's part of it like certainly there were those things that we just discussed right there was a lot of i want to bring this in or i want to do a nod to the armor or i want to do a nod to when i think daredevil's been too violent like there was that scene where he's like i'm going to kill you it's like no 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 we're backing down we're backing down he's like no i'm going to kill you you know you know no no you don't have to kill and he suddenly he's got a gun like you know, what is going on here you know <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. The whole gun thing with him with the gun was that an homage to like that Frank Miller cover? Yeah. He was holding the gun. No, 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 not no, not the Frank Miller cover. Okay. It was actually, and it wasn't an homage. I mean, I love Frank Miller's work. I mean, clearly, I, I I've benefited from it and and admire it. But there is a, I think it's, is it Man Without Fear? I think it's, you know, it's, I think it's the, there's a. I think it's the Daredevil Year One like type of thing he he did with Ramita, but there's a story he did okay. in in the zone of things where Daredevil just just decides to kill somebody, and I remember talking to Ralph about it, and I said that doesn't even in the early days that doesn't feel right, you know, mm -hmm. you know to me. I mean, you're you know um, just for my opinion. So that was my, um, I guess dig, not more than homage, you know, at that sort of thing of having him become suddenly so violent that he is going to 
do it. But obviously it was played out in the whole, you know, the whole structure of the story. Here's somebody else's point of view about Daredevil. You know, one free version he has killer armor and another version he's a he's a you know he's a clown and another version he's a you know somebody who's just gonna pull out a 45 and <laughs> and start like wildly shooting around the the bar like a, a blind man i don't know um <laughs> i love, love in the script you described it was it like yeah who pulls out a dirty hairy style uh you know <laughs> you know uh yeah so that was uh that was uh uh, that was the inspiration for that bit. Yeah, from start to finish, the pace just sucks you in and it takes you on a whirlwind ride for sure. That's and great just, to hear. Yeah, I, I enjoy this. And it's just like, oh, wait, there's not going to be more of this. Which, what, what comes next is okay, but it's always like, I'm always like, I'm, I'm kind of like resistant to change. I hate when creative teams change because it's just like, do we have to? Are you sure? <laughs> And you know, it's it's that's the that's the nature of you know monthly comics too. It's sort of there's, a, a, um, you have to change the teams, or the teams have to change themselves, because you you do. I mean, this is you know conversations fans have, you know professionals have, you know all the time, and, and that's you know there, there's a bit of a beauty to thinking about as much as continuity works for you, right? It, there, there's also something to be, there's appeal in, in thinking about just coming back to characters and telling stories with them that don't always necessarily have to be tied together. Um, you, you know, I love George Miller's Mad Max movies, right? You, be, you know, one on one order of business, you could sort of say he just keeps telling the same story over and over again, yet because he's changed as a filmmaker, right? Mad Max is a completely different movie than Road Warrior, which is a completely different movie than Thunderdome, which is a completely, and, and then Fury Road comes from another planet. You know, that, <laughs> you know, they all they all use the same characters in the same world, and and but he's not worried so much about continuity, right? In in that thing, so he can break apart those things. Whereas if a creative team in a comic that is based in continuity doesn't shake themselves up, you're going to get into a well, you got to make the fans miss what they what they, they yeah had, you know they had yeah. <laughs> well, you, know, you got to keep yourself uh, you know invigorated and sometimes you make decisions that are weird uh, you, you know you move Daredevil to San Francisco right because that writer was in love with San Francisco probably or lived in San Francisco um, and and maybe that works out really well um, because somebody loves that city and then can bring it to life in that way. The only Marvel character that belongs in San Francisco is Venom, because I need him as far away from Spider-Man as possible. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the new trailer? Scary. scary. I mean, scary. I, Woody Hill is, is going to eat up. He's going to eat that, it's, Tom it's, Hardy up. Yeah, it's a really scary trailer. It's it's not like a... It's not, it's not a lot of fun. It's scary, so I have to see where it goes. Well, Carnage is, you know, he can be a, a lot more to handle than Venom. And Woody Harrelson knows how to do psychotic killer. Very oh, well. absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. The scenery. Yeah, exactly. He's uh, He fits really well in there. But, uh, yeah, no, just like what Lilith was saying, like the, the long, uh, you know, arcs. I mean, I think we were... Sp you know, you get a good team and it's like a comfort to you, but I think we were spoiled in like the late eighties and the nineties. Cause I mean, you spent how many years on daredevil? I mean, Mark, oh, yeah. Mark Grunewald, it did my like favorite captain America run was on there for like 10 years. I mean, Peter David was on the Hulk for what? At least 10 years. Peter, it's Peter put stakes down on that. He made that character so much of so much. Of what he did continues yeah. to resonate. I think in that character. Oh yeah, Al Ewing's like re referencing. Yeah, nineties kids are spoiled. Yeah, they're yeah. spoiled with good comic book writers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, should we get to the feedback? Or yeah, yeah. I'm yeah you said you got what some... Ray and Russell have to say. Please. All right. So here I will start with Russell. Let's see what he had to say. Hey everyone, it's Russell here to give my feedback for. Daredevil number 380. Yes, I did end up sending feedback after all. Um, well, this one I feel like is quintessential Daredevil. This feels like all around one of... This is everything you want out of a Daredevil comic. There's action. 
there's intrigue and mystery, there's courtroom drama, there's, you know, um, you know, everything. It's just everything you could want, and it's a nice little um, uh, cherry on top for the Chichester run here. Um, really love the art, Lee Weeks, knocking it out of the park on this one. Um, every, I love how Daredevil looks. I love how, you know, everybody looks. Kingpin, Bullseye, Bushwhacker, the Hand Ninjas, all awesome. Um, the story is really good, really good. Um, I like how you got all these different situations going on at once and then they all kind of converge at the end. Um, the courtroom drama stuff was good. It's unfortunate that some of these, you know, politics are still very relevant to this day. Um, how we view people of other cultures and races and all sorts of stuff. And it's unfortunate that we still have to deal with these problems. Um, uh, the, um, I love the scene where Daredevil kind of has a sensory overload. Um, I don't think that's explored as much as it should be. Obviously, we know Daredevil has heightened uh, hearing and, you know, heightened smell, but we don't really get to see it, like, affect him like it did in this all that often, I feel like. Um, he, I guess he smells the poison and it kind of just shatters all of his reality there for a minute, but... His training and his resolve helps him to at least save some of those poor people drinking the poison water. Does Daredevil have trouble eating, I wonder? Because, you know, the good stuff is going to taste ultra good now, but maybe too good? Would, would really good food actually end up being a detriment to Daredevil? And, of course, bad food, I would imagine, would just be unbearable. Anyway, um, yeah, this is good stuff. Um, I would love to see a what if issue all about Death Devil. <laughs> that was uh, awesome. Very 90s. Very cool. Um, yeah, but anyway, there's if I had to give this a letter grade, I would give this an A. I really enjoyed this, and I'm not. I'm not just blowing smoke because Mr. Chichester is on the show. I genuinely enjoyed this, and I feel like this was, even though it's kind of a swan song, it kind of feels like a great introductory Daredevil issue as well. So um, those are my thoughts. And uh, Capes and Lunatics and Mr. Chichester, uh, looking forward to hearing more from from you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Russell. Wait, Steve before we go to Ray, he just cracked the code. This is why Matt's not married. He can't lie to his wife about her terrible cooking. <laughs> I just, we, Russell helped me crack the code. Thank you, Russell. Now we know. Um, Russell, thank you. That was amazing. Uh, thank you for picking up on so much stuff. And if we could reprint this book and, uh, and put everything you want out of a Daredevil story on the on the cover blurb, I would, uh, you know, I would go go with that. So, uh, um, really, that's a, a terrific uh, review, and you hit you hit all the things so well. And I hadn't really, you know, the food the food angle is really interesting. That would be uh, something to definitely play with. I would I never really played with that or thought about that much. And you have to wonder: does he eat more? Does he even more purposefully eat more bland foods just for that reason? You know, to to sort of counteract all other things. But then I, I always think that Matt's bad at self-care too. And that just oh, he's like, Foggy has to like yeah. throw like an insurer at him. Have you eaten a day? Yeah, <laughs> Have you just, just been drinking iced coffee he's all a, day? He's a wreck. He's, he's just a wreck. You know, he's just... <laughs> just picture him flipping over a building, like eating a sandwich or something. Right, right, right. 
Um, uh, before I get the Ray Lil, should I make his day uh, and ask Mr. Chichester if he would have any uh, thoughts on like, would you be interested or have thoughts on like writing a Moon Knight story? Because Ray is like a huge Moon Knight fan. Um, you know, Moon Knight, I don't know that well. I mean, I I, I know I know the character, I know the the background. Um, uh, but I, and I know the appeal he has for so many people. Um, but I've never shied away from from wanting to play with uh, with different characters. Um, and I believe there's a, some Moon Knight stuff coming up, right? There's a Moon Knight show. Uh, a new book, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's uh, that would be be a new a new challenge, a new opportunity. So if anything ever came like that, who knows? Okay, we'll start the petition on it. All right. <laughs> Hey, I mean, Marvel, I mean, you heard the fans are already clamoring for a uh, Chichester Weeks uh, uh, Death Devil uh, miniseries. I think that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if, I don't know if Lee wants to go with a Death Devil, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but there could be something. There's your, there's your next gag. Hey, Lee, they want us to do that Death Devil. Uh, exactly. You thought, you thought it took a, up the phone. Not exactly. You thought, it, you thought it, it took a lot to convince you of last time because uh, this time it's really going to be something. All right, let's get to Ray. All right, our big Moon Knight fan. Hello, Phil Lilith and DG Chichester. Um, hello, this is this is Ray dropping in some thoughts for Dead Evil 380. Um, before I kick off with anything, I just wanted to say a big hello to DG Chichester. It's, it's a real great pleasure to, to hear you on the Capes and Lunatics um, podcast. And, and being a, a big fan of yours back in the 90s as well with your Daredevil run, uh, it's, it's a real privilege to, to have this feedback kind of reach your ears. So um, anyway, uh, with Daredevil 380, look, just the main, um, I guess, overarching impression I get of, of it was that I, I really did enjoy it, that there was a, a grand epicness and, and scale to it, which uh, you'd come to expect, I guess, with, with such a milestone issue. Uh, it, it ending capping off uh, volume one. Um, just the the amount, like the, the the sheer amount of of characters and multiple plots within this, uh, I thought were very well interwoven together. Um, so the I guess the, the the story with Matt Murdock as well, uh, with the gentleman accused of, um, of terrorism, uh, that interweaving with. Uh, Kingpin and his own plans and and what he was wanting to do, uh, and and of course then uh, the the likes of, of like Bushwhacker and and Bullseye and and, and having those supervillains uh, face off against Daredevil, uh, and then also as well what I really did enjoy was this aspect of that being kind of part of the news and um, it being spread word of mouth, mm. uh, which I thought was a very interesting um, interesting way. To kind of frame the that story of uh, of that eventual I guess event that happened uh, on on the ship. Uh, excuse the background noise here. I am just outside the office, just giving my thoughts, and we are unfortunately next to a main road. But anyway, hopefully you don't get too much of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I love this story. Uh, the art was great as as, as always. I mean, I, I I do love a lot of the Daredevil art. Um, but yeah, really did love the epicness and just the dare I say, like just the mastery of, of, of handling like all these plots and all these characters together and, and making it a coherent uh, and engaging, um, but also at the same time a quite a quite complex story to put together. So um, yeah, really really cool. Um, the the thing about Daredevil, which I do like, uh, that sets him apart from. I guess the other big ticket um, heroes in the Marvel Universe is that a lot of his adventures uh, aren't necessarily overly like flamboyant. They're very tied to, I know it sounds cliche, to the street level, um, but his battles and his fights aren't necessarily that mm. of, you know, fireworks and bells and whistles. Um, and although we do get some really cool fights here with, uh, with the four assassins, um, uh, that Kingpin sends forward. I mean, much of the enjoyment for this work was the groundwork laid, I think, um, for I guess this lead up for Daredevil, 
um, on that big ship at the end. Uh, but also, um, uh, you know, in, in his civvies as well as Matt Murdock and, and what goes on um, behind the doors of the Kingpin and, and his crime syndicate. Mm-hmm. So that sort of stuff is really, for me, um, the grassroots for Daredevil. And, and I loved how that kind of came out here. Uh, and as always, again, like I know it, it's very synonymous with Daredevil, but the fact that the city itself has its, its, its uh, a character of its own, uh, and that very much came across as well with, you see a lot of scenes of like residents of the city um, talking, as I mentioned, talking about Daredevil and, and what they'd seen on the news, that sort of stuff. So I, I loved how we got these differing perspectives. Uh, it just gave a different kind of flavour to the storytelling, uh, and it made it, uh, yeah, just made it a lot more grounded, if I can say that. I keep on saying that, but a lot more grounded and a lot more, um, a lot more of a, yeah, just a different kind of adventure that you don't usually, that you wouldn't get with, you know, the likes of the Avengers or or um, or the Fantastic Four, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's very, very earnest stuff. Anyway, um, those are my thoughts. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. I, I would give this. Um, I would give this a good, uh, a good A. Of course, um, it's a. It was a real treat to read. Uh, like I said, it, it's something that's worth reading over and over again as well because there's just so much in it. So, um, so anyway, uh, thanks for listening to me, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to this discussion between. Uh, between yourselves, Phil Lilith and and DG Chichester. Anyway, take care. Catch you later. I love how everybody is just forced to say your full name. <laughs> no, I guess it doesn't. Like, no, it doesn't sound right. We have it to do doesn't. It thing. doesn't work with just the, uh, the the other thing. Although my wife, you know, for the longest time, just called me Deej. I think I, you know, but that was um, Ray. That was amazing. That was uh, uh, thank you again. You know, like Russell for picking up on so many things that are that are in there. I mean, it's just it's just great that it comes across it from a you know from a writer's perspective and creative perspective but but more importantly for somebody who's a fan of the book and the character you know that all those things added up uh for you uh i'm just uh very pleased to hear that and uh and very grateful that you know you gave it so much uh you know attention and, and thought and, and and that it works for you in that way oh yeah all right any final questions Lil? or should we let this man get on with his stuff let, let- have his Saturday. We really thoroughly enjoy, obviously, having conversations with. Yeah, you, you guys are. To many more. You guys are great, and I, and I look forward to that too. And I just want to thank you both. I mean, just for, I mean, doing this, you know, on a, on a regular basis, we're going to be doing. But you know, having this conversation and hearing Russell and Ray and and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think among my Daredevil, uh, you know, pieces, you know, Fall from Grace, Fall of the Kingpin, you know, they get a lot of attention for for good reason. Um, but this issue meant a lot, you know, it meant a lot for the reasons that we, we talked about and, uh, and, and it doesn't probably get as much attention. There may be a lot of people who just don't even know that it exists, you know, because it sort of came, you know, after a, a, a call it a so-so run of things like Daredevil sort of running out, you know, uh, you know, his steam on what came before, and then it was going to pick up with the big, the bigger attention of, of Joe and, and Kevin Smith. Um, so I don't know that it's quite lost in between things, but maybe a little bit, but I, I really appreciate you guys giving it its due because I, I know what we put into it and hearing it shows in every single page. Honestly. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's nice that it gets a little spotlight. I mean, for myself and for Lee, but I think also just for the character and just the sense of what Ray and Russell are kind of saying, like it's, it's, it hits, you know, so many of the, the daredevil notes that we all enjoy um, that uh, um, I'm, I'm going to be bouncing on this for at least the rest of the day. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. I was going to say, I mean, and two, this is all Marvel Unlimited, but maybe I don't, it's just because it is like a one and done issue, it's like it's kind of hard to collect and trade because like Fall from Grace, that's like a nice package, the you know, right. seven issue run. I mean, do they have? They probably don't like a, like a Chichester collection where they take all your issues, and then this could be the last issue in the collection. Yeah, no, I mean it's um, I I um, like I said to you at the beginning, maybe before we turn the mic on, but you know, I always it was always tough to find until fairly recently. A lot of the things I'd worked on with Daredevil didn't seem to rate collections. You know, while there had there had been a Fall from Grace collection, 
that sort of fell off the radar and you couldn't find the original one which i actually was looking at for one reason or another so like this was the original like sort of standalone like fall from grace collection that yeah. was that was put together and then it wasn't on the bookshelves forever or the original last rights or fall from the kingpin collection you couldn't find that amongst all the other daredevil collections now they're starting to put that into the epic you know the big epic uh you know collections of many many titles uh which i was joking with lee about like they did one they called it the fall of the kingpin and then we're number four and five on the credits list <laughs> which you know there's many people in there so that's fine yeah. it's like there's not it's not just us but it's always funny when they do that you know, that there's there was one that was called root of evil which was referencing the title of the Electra story and i think that me and scott are like four and five in the credits list again so um but uh but yeah it would be nice if this if this you know uh got some more attention and now you've given it more attention and i will take this podcast and i will push the hell out of it everywhere i can to say look listen we were talking about this you should go read this issue nice but uh I, it, it, do you think this did uh like fall from grace and stuff get like a second life maybe around like the uh, netflix series and um not so much i don't think i mean I, I think it's it's you know it's definitely its own story i you know i i think i mentioned that, you guys does marvel, does marvel put stuff like back in the the wow oh, they put more stuff into circulation because of that i, I don't yeah. know i mean certainly it's it's shown up in you know some of those collections and and you know there was a epic collection that was many stories that was called i think fall from grace even though it had many other issues around it um, uh, but I don't know that, you know, it was tied to the, to the, to the shows. I think there's always been a, and you know, you'll hear this from a lot of people who worked, you know, to create comics and people who run comic book stores and such. There's always a, a, a ridiculous disconnect between the movies and the TV shows and the comics. Like why doesn't every show end with read the ongoing adventures of Daredevil in the monthly comic or read the avengers every month from marvel comics like why isn't that the first you know uh, a credit after the movie ends or the tv show ends I, i've never what, what would that take <laughs> you know nothing you know like literally so why isn't there that connection to drive the interest exactly i think we've even said that it's like why don't you get a commercial well, publication isn't necessarily future proof but media as in television and movies is a little future proof is kind of my thinking about that but maybe yeah, maybe unfortunately I, I totally agree with that though and you know not for nothing uh Arrowverse over on the Blancy verse they actually do do that and they have like tie-ins and stuff they do okay. that synergy because they have to <laughs> yep. Yep. so but yeah Marvel is, I feel like they just feel like it's just two different things and like people that are only comic book fans aren't necessarily you know there's some of those that still exist like, that don't do the MCU thing maybe or maybe somebody you know made some decision that it would it would confuse people something you know because because you know the public's are the public are idiots yeah we know. Right. We're, you know or, or i i have no idea you know you, like chris hemsworth is thor here and then i'm going to pick up the thor comic and it's it, it, thor is somebody else you know thor is, i know, you know punisher's looking a lot like john barrett all these days <laughs> Well, that was the whole thing with like uh, Samuel L. Jackson, right? You know, Samuel oh. L. Jackson became became Nick Nick Fury in the comics became Samuel L. Jackson, and then then when they cast Nick Fury, who else are you going to cast except Samuel L. Jackson? You know? <laughs> Again, like, that's why can't they advertise? Because it seems like it's not a lot of times in the comics they try to incorporate stuff from the movies and the X Men. <laughs> yeah, X Men all of a sudden started wearing black leather in the comics. It's like okay. Yeah, I, I well, they are trying to create that synergy. Maybe if we push for it more, like, hey, you know, you do still own that comic book side of things, right? Maybe you should push that. Yeah, you would think. I mean, there, there definitely was in going back to when I was involved with it, there could be corporate pushes from above from, you know, you need you need to incorporate this into your story because this is happening in a movie. Right. This needs to kind of go down. So, you know, stuff flows downhill. Um, but I don't know that that always activates back the other direction in the sense again of just why don't you can't you just promote the comic yeah. in the film or put it or in the movie or the TV series. So whatever we're uh, 
we'll we'll we have a few more episodes together to solve all the world's problems. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Before we let you go, I'll let you promote. But first, I'll give you you and the listeners their feet uh, the homework. Uh, next time when Mr. Chichester joins us, uh, I wanted to cover Daredevil three hundred five and three hundred six, the Surgeon General story. Oh, okay. Yes, Spider Man. Yes. All right. My 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 homework is in place. I will I will go down that road, um, and we'll talk about that inspiration. Um, excellent. Okay, guys, as always, thank you. This is terrific. My plug is please, listeners, uh, check out my newsletter at storymaze.substack.com. That's my big plug for this time out, a weekly newsletter of writing stuff and creative stuff and comic stuff, and people seem to be having fun with it. And then next month, I will have another plug to go in addition to that one um, uh, to just talk up a little bit of something, which would be fun. So uh, you got that to think about. You can plug as much as you, hey, you, you're giving us a lot of your time. You can plug as many things as you want. Like. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and, and oh, kids, okay, go buy your Fall from Grace collections. and. Uh, yes. Yeah, that. go, go. We're all talking about these stories. You know, check them out. And, and, and just as a reminder, if you do go for that newsletter uh, and you sign up for it, uh, this plot to Daredevil 380, not the comic itself, but the plot, uh, you will get a free copy of uh, for signing up. Yes. All right. So, yes, thank you again so much. I mean, you said you have fun. We we thoroughly enjoy these chats, uh, this inside knowledge you give us at <laughs> month. My pleasure. All right. Uh, Don't make them sit through the plugs, Phil. I know. I won't. I won't. <laughs> I'm happy to. Go plug. Do the plugs. Get your Do the whole show. Get it. Get it wrapped up. All right. Okay. All right. So, kids, yes, uh, in one month when Mr. Chichester comes back, there to 305 and 306. So, uh, send me your 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 emails. Your, you know, like you hear, you can send uh, audio, like mm -hmm. uh, Russell and the, the Giddy Ray. Uh, so, yes, email us, capes and lunatics at gmail.com or call the voicemail 614 382 2737. That's 614 38 capes. And remember to follow the devil you know. Uh, and <laughs> Podcast. podcast, yes, and links to all the social media for all the various uh, shows we do. Uh, links to this YouTube. Hey, do you want to know what uh, Mr. G.G. Chichester looks like? Yeah, so go subscribe to our YouTube. <laughs> uh, links to our Patreon, links to our merchandise, uh, all in one place. That's Linktree, L I N K T R dot E E slash Capes and Lunatics. This is weird doing it with an audience. Uh, and. <laughs> Uh, please go support our sponsors, Tweaked Audio and Hunt a Killer. Uh, get yourself some good. Don't forget to use that Southgate code on both. Yes, the Southgate Media Group. And but more importantly, go pick up our book. <laughs> Pod Life, the book. Yes, I'm in there. Uh, yes, uh, just stories from podcasters. Uh, if you're ever curious about the world of podcasting, and you can pick that up on Amazon. And when you do, use the link for Southgate Media Group right down there in the show notes. Help us support this show. The network and the man pulling the strings, Rob, the master doom south. He pit himself. <laughs> <with> <laughs> <Southgate> <laughs> Media Group. Make it rain. Gonna burn. So says Master Doom. Okay. <laughs> Willis, where can people find where can people find you online? You can find me live tweeting Legends of Tomorrow on Sundays uh, over on Twitter at Lil Hellfire. And of course, me not making content at Lil Hellfire69 on TikTok and Instagram. I'm 12. We need me to be 12. <laughs> Bye, Felicia. <laughs> Bye, Felicia. Okay, kids. Uh, thank you for listening. Man. Thank you once again. That's right. We get to call No one else. Uh, but again, th thank you so much. As you can see, we, you know, we get... You know, all this uh, feedback and like, every, you know, everyone joining us. Everyone's always excited. All right, guys. Good seeing you both. Thank you, sir. Hey, you made Ray all giddy. <laughs> I know. He was so cute. He was like, oh, 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 yeah. Oh. Never heard his never heard voice for that high before.
But yes, I love these chaps. But thanks, but thanks guys for kissing his butt, so he feels like he's better. I was just like, Ray, if you didn't give it an A, you're dead to us. I know, he was like smoking. I'm like, well, you better give this an A, kid. <laughs> All right, come back in one week. Well, come back next time for Atlantis Attacks, and then in one month, DG Chichester. But until then, it's better Stick to- Stick with the devil you know!